Hi, welcome back if you've already seen the first part of this tutorial series, which was based around importing a high quality real world terrain data based off of LiDAR into Unreal after having passed it through Houdini to do a minimal amount of processing. If you haven't already watched that part, recommend going back and checking it out as this landscape and the following tutorial and all the work that I'm going to be showing here uh, is based off of that uh, initial uh, workshop. And if you're new to landscapes and uh, terrains in general, or if you've never explored this kind of workflow before, uh, I think you might, you'll might you probably find it really useful. The goal with these videos, and more broadly with this channel, is to provide a beginner-friendly entry point into some slightly more advanced workflows and techniques that you can use, where you combine Houdini with, and Unreal uh, and other software uh, to get the best looking results in the shortest amount of time. And you don't have to be uh, an extremely experienced artist anymore in order to get something that looks really professionally done and well made. And this is largely due to how the tools have evolved, which now allows you to get what's in your head onto the screen in a much, much shorter time period than was ever previously possible. I also aim to show and prove that Houdini isn't the scary tool that it once was, and that uh, experienced environment artists coming from other tools will have no problem at all just picking it up and getting a flying start. So what are we going to look at today? We're going to look at how can we generate a flow map inside of Houdini without having to run any simulations. And we're going to look at how we can mask by certain features of the landscape in order to quickly produce the results that you need to create a convincing uh, terrain material inside of Unreal. Or more specifically, I should say, not to create the material itself, but to create the distribution maps, which will tell the material where to apply different textures. We will also look at how do we set up in Unreal uh, a material which uh, can use those maps to uh, blend between different layers. However, we will not be plugging in any textures today or taking the material to final quality. This will be more of a beginner tutorial in how do you start to create the resources that you will need when it comes to finally make a material. Okay, so I've already got Houdini open. Uh, I've got the terrain file that we worked on in the last session. And uh, I'm gonna pull over this remap and output uh, that I've created previously. And I'm just gonna press Shift-O on the keyboard to bound that in a little comment box there. And up here, I'm gonna write uh, height output, just to keep that nice and clear. And I'm actually gonna do one other thing here, which is I'm gonna rename the final output node as well to height output or how should I call this? Let's call this terrain height. There we go. And now inside of the node itself, I'm going to go up to where it says dollar hip exports. And here you can see I've written the name of the file. So what we're going to do here, just to make our life a little bit easier, because I'm all about laziness and being a productive 3D artist often involves taking advantage of these kinds of time-saving features, is if we just look at this example where I've written dollar hip here, which found the current directory uh, of where the uh, the project file itself is saved on disk, uh, we're going to use another command uh, similar to this, which is $OS. We're going to replace the name of the file here with dollar. You can see this context sensitive menu pops up with all the options available. And we're going to type in OS. So what that's going to do is it's just going to find the name of the current node. So this just lets us be a little bit lazier. Uh, we don't have to type out the name inside of the file name path. We can just go ahead and copy this node. And this time we're going to call it layer one. So now anything that gets output from this node is going to use the name of the node itself. And we won't have to manually go and change anything up here. This is, uh, you know, really advantageous if you just want to copy and paste these. And you can see that now we're not going to end up with a load of identically named files on disk accidentally overwriting each other. So just a little tip there. We're going to go up to before where we did the remap, because if you remember, we only did this remap so that we were able to export the height in the range of zero to one. So zero to one values. Uh, and so that we knew uh, the actual altitude of the terrain at different points. What we're going to do now, we're going to drag down from the height field project itself and press tab to start searching for a node. And we're just going to search HF flow, HF flow field. We're actually going to have a little look at the description of that node before we dive in. You see, if we move the mouse over to it, I believe it gives us a description. Or maybe I've been lying to myself the whole time. Where does it give us the information? Maybe it doesn't. Well, if you want to find out more information about a node or what any particular node does, you can just select, you can select the node itself and go up to this little drop down here and press help. 
and that's going to bring up the documentation for every node and every single uh, surface operator in Houdini uh, has this documentation and uh, it's pretty exhaustive and often comes with examples and links to other related nodes so I highly recommend that you get used to using this functionality if you're going to be exploring Houdini. So now we're going to switch the focus uh, that is we're going to hit this blue icon and set this as our current display. Now you're going to notice that this takes a little bit of time. Uh, I've got a reasonably, pow reasonably powerful processor uh, and it's still going to take a, a bit of time. So if you're on a lower spec machine, this could take a little bit of time. Uh, but this is what you're going to end up with at the end there. Now, this isn't really the result of a true simulation because nothing is happening to the height field itself. What it's doing is it's effectively performing a kind of simulation where it's looking at how sort of a grains will fall and slide down the surface of the landscape and then that naturally produces this result similar to if you imagine that the uh, the real world terrain if it didn't actually absorb water and it rained all of the water would flow off of it in this manner and kind of go into these little rivulets that you get and for us uh, this is really really useful node to uh, to help us extract some data that's going to look really really cool if we like apply a kind of like gravel or sediment or well, I suppose it depends on what kind of terrain you're, you're really making, but um, this is a great map to get. You'll notice, I'm going to take a little break here just to discuss something that's commonly seen in Unreal Engine landscapes, which is you'll notice that on the marketplace, there's like uh, tons and tons of uh, landscape auto materials. So you can absolutely go that route. But I'm going to search landscape auto material UE4. There's on the, I believe that there's some free ones online. Um, let's search Epic Games Marketplace. See what see what's available to us. Uh, this is a uh, customizable landscape auto material, and this is this is just one of many. I should, probably shouldn't uh, shouldn't give particular favor to any one of them, but you can have a look through uh, and decide for yourself uh, which which material you think suits your project. Uh, and actually, I'm just going to quickly see if I can get a hold of that free uh, landscape material because I have noticed a while ago on Reddit someone was sharing. A wonderful landscape material for free, which is an excellent resource for beginners. Uh, let's see if this is indeed the one I hope to get to. No, that is not it. Um, let's have a look in here. Free Andrew. Yeah, so this is the this is the post that I was hoping to find, uh, and I will certainly link this in the description. And you can you can get a hold of the material used to produce this beautiful landscape for free, um, thanks to uh, its creator here, uh, Oak. Uh, apologies. Apologies if I've butchered your name there, um, but he, he gives a little bit of information about, or they give a little bit of information about uh, what went into the material. You don't have to worry about any of that. You can just plug it in and use it. Now, that kind of aside was to talk about something that you'll commonly see in these materials, which is that they call themselves landscape auto materials. So what does that mean? It means that inside of the material for the landscape itself, they're doing some things like detecting the slope angle. That will result in something that looks a little bit like this. And you can do this in Houdini as well, but we wouldn't really need to because, as I said, and as these other materials take advantage of, you can just do that in Unreal in the material. So there's no need for us to extract that here. However, the kind of data that it is useful to extract from Houdini is the kind of data that you cannot easily use in the material in Unreal. And this flow field is an example of that. I'm sure that more technically minded among us might say, well, actually you could do this kind of effect inside of Unreal in the material editor. Uh, but for you know the average user, uh, that's probably a little bit beyond um, us as just regular old artists. So we can take advantage of the fact that Houdini comes with this node right out of the box. I don't even feel like I need to process this at all. Uh, I'm quite happy with the result I'm getting straight away, although you could go in and change all of these values. So I'm just gonna plug that into the height field layer down there. I'm going to go and just check through these settings. They, nothing will have changed because I just copied the node. So that's all good. Um, the only thing I do need to change is we don't want to export the height. We want to export the color information. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and click this little drop down over here. And you see, we get now a bunch of options. We get flow, flow direction, and water. Uh, we could export any of those and see what they gave us. But because this is red in the viewport, I know that this is just how Houdini renders the layer called mask. So I'm gonna select mask because that's got the information that I want. If I wanted to preview the result that we were getting from, for example, the water layer, then what I can do is I can type in light field copy layer over here. 
and we can change the source to water and the destination to mask. And this is what we get from the water layer. So this could be this could be interesting as well, um, but it's probably possibly not going to be uh, accurate enough. Um, that said, you may be able to do some post processing and get some really nice kind of like riverbed uh, riverbed sort of shading going on, uh, or at least weight blending between different landscape layers. I'm not going to worry about that for now. I'm just going to keep things simple, and uh, we're going to go with that. So I'm going to do Shift O again to bound these in a comment box, and I'm going to call this. So now you can see that after I accidentally disconnected those, I press Control Z. It actually has to recook everything. Okay, so I wasn't going to talk about this, but it seems like a sort of an interesting point. It's so like this is a this is a 4K texture, and we're doing a simulation on it. That's quite quite resource intensive. I don't want it to do that every single time I just open the project file. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to press Tab. That was not Tab that I pressed. I'm going to press tab and I'm going to search for a node called file cache. By default, uh, you can see that it's saving a frame range here. We don't want to save a frame range because we're not doing any kind of animation or, or simulation. Uh, we just want to save the current frame. And we're going to go ahead and hit load from disk, uh, even though it currently doesn't have anything to load. And we're just going to slot that into the uh, into the into uh, in between the terrain layer one and the flow field there. And this is going to give us an error. And that is because it's trying to load from disk something which doesn't exist yet. So what we need to do is hit save to disk. And what that's going to do is save the result of this process that we've just run or any nodes above it. And that means it can just retrieve that result straight from disk next time we open Houdini. Really useful, but you have to remember that you're loading the cache result. So if you make any changes above this point, they will not be reflected in this output node until you hit save to disk again. So we're gonna leave that there. Uh, and now that we've got the mask selected here, we're going to go ahead and hit save to disk. Now I'm going to go up and click on this open, open floating file chooser. That's what that's called. And you can see that we've got the relative path. That, that dollar hip sign means look in the current project directory. And uh, it's inside the exports folder. We can see we've got our two files. I'm just going to right click up here, click expand path, control A, control C. I'm going to go to Windows Explorer. I'm going to paste that address in there. And we can now see that we've got both the height and we've got the uh, this new mask that we've output. And I'm just going to double click that mask because I really just like how it looks. I think it's groovy. I think it's cool. I can't believe I just used the word groovy on an actual stream. Um, it's not even a stream. I'm, I'm losing the plot today. Yeah, it just looks really cool anyway. So I'm pretty happy with that. You could definitely do a lot more with it, sort of apply some distortion, mask it using slope and other values, but we're just going to go with the default default out of the box because what we're all about today is speed. And we're going to go back into Houdini and we're going to go over to this node. And as I previously said, we don't need to mask by slope because we can do slope masking direct in Unreal. So there's no point in us doing that here. So I'm going to disable that mask by slope. Now we have no mask at all, but you can see we've actually got a bunch of other features that we can use to mask by. We can mask by height. There's no need to do that. We can do that in Unreal. We can mask by direction. There's no need to do that. We can do that in Unreal. As a general principle, the simpler the uh, maths that's required to calculate the mask, the more likely and easy it would be to implement that kind of masking directly in Unreal, which may be the subject of a, a future tutorial. But uh, you can see we've got two very interesting ones. We've also got peaks and we've got valleys. Oh, sorry, peaks and valleys and occlusion. Uh, so occlusion is ambient occlusion. Uh, that means it's going to, if you're a 3D artist, you'll be very familiar with what ambient occlusion does. Um, and if you're not familiar with what ambient occlusion is, it is the blocking of light. In, in, in essence, that is. If you imagine that we have a, uh, a, hem a sort of a hemisphere that is the sky, I will just draw it. If we have the hemisphere that is the sky and the rays are coming down onto the scene, you can imagine that this area inside the valley is going to have certain rays obstructed by the surrounding terrain. And that results in this area being darker. Okay, so we're not lighting the terrain, so why would we care about occlusion? Well, you have to think about the effect that light and heat has on a terrain. If an area receives less light uh, and heat or wind, for example, then there's a possibility that that area is going to be more humid, more moist, more or less eroded. Um, 
It could be a more likely place for trees to seek shelter from the elements. So this kind of occlusion masking can generate a really useful texture that we don't just use to, uh, to actually apply materials to the landscape itself, but it can actually create a mask that we can use to drive things like foliage spawning or where we put rocks or uh, any number of different things really. So let's go and give that a shot. Let's turn on mask by occlusion. So the larger your landscape and the weaker your CPU, it kind of goes without saying, the slower this operation will be. And just to visualize that a little bit more clearly, I'm just gonna go up to the very top and hit invert mask so we can see the, the areas where that occlusion has been generated. And uh, this is a really, really useful mask that you could use to, uh, yeah, I don't know, suggest that some areas are, are, are damper than others, uh, you know, because moisture collects there. Uh, some areas, the, the areas that have maybe more plant life because they're not as exposed to the elements. Um, and we can go ahead and kind of tweak this. But you'll notice that if you try to pull the slider, your Houdini is just going to choke up and freeze. And that's because it's trying to update the scene every single kind of, I don't know, millisecond that you're dragging this slider. Every single time that you drag this slider, Houdini's getting a new signal and having to try and update the scene. So this comes to another useful little switch you can switch on in Houdini when you're working on large terrains, which is right down at the bottom right here. You can see there's this uh, box that says auto update. And that auto update does what it says on the tin. It just causes the scene to... Uh, to adjust on the fly to whatever you're doing as you're dragging sliders. And sometimes that's really desirable behavior, but for us, it's just slowing things down. So we're gonna go ahead and choose on mouse up. It acts in a very similar way to auto update, except for the fact that it's not going to try and update every single time you drag around this widget, just when you release it. So this allows us to kind of go in and tweak the strength of that mask that we're generating and create a result that we think works for us. And I think that's looking pretty cool, actually. So uh, I can kind of imagine that some trees or foliage would be getting scattered in the, uh, the really dark areas um, and the uh, lighter areas over here might be more prone to kind of collecting sort of smaller bushes and, and shrubs. So we're gonna go ahead and export that to disk. I'm gonna go and copy the terrain layer one over there. I'm gonna disconnect it. So I'm gonna hold Y on the keyboard and drag with my left mouse to slice through that, uh, that connection there. You just Y and drag. Okay, so I'm going to select the second output here. And because we've set that $OS sign up here, I don't even need to rename the output file. I can just go ahead and hit save the disk. We go to that, uh, that folder and we'll just wait for that to pop in there. And you'll see that indeed it is called Terrain Layer 2. There we go. Now, I can't be the only one that thinks that these kinds of terrain weight maps look absolutely awesome. Uh, and a lot better than some of the stuff you'll find in a modern art gallery. Um, so uh, yeah, another win for nature, I guess. But just look how much interesting and rich, varied detail there is in there. And I think this is a really good example of how you don't need to create a complex setup in order to create incredibly complex looking results. You just need to layer a few simple behaviors, says he who did not program the uh, occlusion generator. I have no idea how complex the maths is involved in calculating ambient occlusion, uh, so maybe I should hold my tongue. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and generate one more mask. I'm kind of going to kind of imagine that that one we've generated there is like a, a foliage distribution mask or like a, um, a humidity or like a, how, a shelteredness mask. And now I want to do one which is going to kind of look for rocks or kind of pretend that we're going to find rocks. So I'm going to turn off the mask by occlusion. I'm going to do mask instead by curvature. Now, because a useful way to think about this might be that because rocks are generally the hardest things in the landscape, you know, relative to the soil and the sand and the, the dirt and everything else, the hummus of the leaves, um, rocks are the things which are going to erode the slowest uh, and thus they're going to be the sharpest. So if you kind of use that logic, then it's just one small step to thinking, okay, so if I find the things which have the highest degree of curvature, that is, they change the most quickly in their shape, uh, then those are probably the areas that are likely to be rocks. So let's test that theory. By default, you might end up with something that looks a lot like this, uh, which isn't ideal. Uh, it's been a while since I've saved, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control S. And uh, I'm gonna go to where it says max curvature, and I'm just gonna click Compute Range and see what that gives us. Okay, it's changed slightly. Uh, it's giving us something a bit different, but I wouldn't really call it useful at this point. 
so this could kind of like turn you away from using this like particular setting if you don't get the results you're looking for at first, but you just need to be a little bit patient with it. So what I'm going to do, and this is just my own personal experience and practice, is I'm going to drag this much, 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 much closer to zero. And we're going to see what that gives us. And straight away, that's something that is not exactly what I'm looking for, but it's something. Now I'm just going to go ahead and delete these points on the curvature ramp there. And then I'm going to just make the ramp a whole lot simpler by just dragging this to the point there. So you don't have to manually point dra drag points around. You can also go and use a bunch of uh, helpful presets that you've got uh, available in this drop down here. You can see that we've got this sort of smooth slope there. Uh, this is the standard linear one, and uh, you have a whole bunch of options that you can choose from. Uh, so before even going in and manually tweaking points, you can just take a look here and see if something fits your purposes a little bit better. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and manually drag the points around. So let's have a little zoom in and see what we're getting. It's kind of doing the inverse of what I hope to achieve here. It almost looks a bit like the flow field. You could probably combine this with the flow field to create a, an interesting result that would potentially suggest, you know, where the gravel slides down the hill or which areas of soil are most loose. Where would you not potentially get foliage? Um, but I'm going to go up to the very top and I'm going to invert that mask or uninvert it, as it were. And we're going to see that it's starting to do an interesting thing, which is it's picking out the ridge lines. That is a lot more in line with kind of what I was what I was setting out to achieve. But at the moment, it's even picking out these smoother areas, which isn't really what I'm going for. So I kind of want to limit it to the areas that only have the most curvature. And then I want to make those areas look a lot more prominent. So I'm going to drag the leftmost point here. And I'm going to drag it all the way up to the halfway mark in the hopes that it will cut out some of those values. So that's starting to work. OK. We're getting some very interesting, uh, what I can only imagine must be fields and uh, furrow lines. Uh, another one of the things that you would have to spend an awful lot of time. Uh, and in fact, on a recent project, I did spend an awful lot of time trying to come up with a procedural way of creating nice fields. And here you have it just as a result of the data. But I don't want them. So I'm just going to do one other thing, which is I want to mask them by height. So I'm going to go and press mask by height and then click compute range. And once I've hit compute range, you're going to see that I get this uh, sort of selection of the landscape based off of height. And uh, I'm going to go get rid of these points here and create just a linear ramp uh, like I had for the curvature at the start. And you can see that's starting to select the top of the mountains, which is where I want to get them, really. Now, I'm just going to play around with these values here uh, until I can kind of bring up the strength of that mask higher up the mountain slopes and, and have, the, have them descend a little bit closer to the valley floor. Uh, while keeping the valley floor itself free of any kind of masking by just pulling that along there at the end. And this is starting to look a little bit more like uh, kind of the mask that I want to create, which just picks out the rocky tops of these, these mountainous areas here. And uh, I, think, I think that'll do. And we'll, we'll, we'll use that and call it a day from last week. OK, so I'm going to copy that terrain layer to there. I'm going to slice through, hold Y on the keyboard and left shift, left click and drag to, to get to cut that wire. And I'm going to hit save to disk. I'm going to wait for that to pop in here. OK, so we've got three really cool weight maps in addition to our height data. If we load back up Unreal, uh, I'm just going to tweak a couple of quality settings that I uh, turned up for the thumbnail creation. So I'm going to type in CSM res, which is cascaded shadow map resolution. And I'm going to put that back to 4192, which is the default resolution. I put it up to 8K for the, uh, for the thumbnail. And uh, now I'm going to go and press shift F2, shift 2, not shift F2, shift 2 to go back to the landscape editing panel. And we're just going to have a quick little look uh, in here at the different tabs available to us. So this is the default Manage tab, and we don't need this for now. We're also not going to do any sculpting for the time being. So we want to go to the Paint tab. But you'll see that we're actually missing any layers at the moment. And if you had applied one of those landscape auto materials that uh, I pointed out to you earlier to the material, you would actually see that you had a few uh, layers available to be painted. But we're going to just go ahead and make a kind of, I don't know, I don't really want to call it a landscape material, but we're just going to set up like the very essence of a landscape material. Um, so that we can see those layers and preview some basic colors on the terrain. 
So I'm going to go right click in the content browser and create a new material. I'm going to call this M Landscape Beginner. I'm going to double click that to open it. I'm going to just move that over to the correct screen. And uh, this is what you'll be confronted with. If you're new to the Unreal Material Editor, um, it can be a little bit intimidating. Um, but don't worry, nothing that we're going to do today is that complex. And actually, in essence, landscape materials aren't that complex. Really, you just take a few simple layers and you blend them together. That can result in an absolutely sprawling nightmare of nodes. Um, and we're going to kind of take that route for now because it's just conceptually a little bit easier to wrap your head around. But down the line, we'll look at the new, relatively new landscape layers feature, not landscape layers, material layers feature, which, uh, which greatly simplifies the process of creating and working with landscape materials. That's going to be for a future workshop, but this here will just kind of show you how to start working and thinking about landscape materials. So if you create a material, you have this material attributes node, and we're actually going to change this. So you might not be familiar with this, but we're going to click on the node itself, and we're going to go down to the bottom left here, and we're going to click use material attributes. And my computer's just started to chug a bit, so I'm just going to go ahead and control Control SSA Houdini and close that down to free up some system resources while I work in Unreal. I'm also going to go in here, and I'm just going to make sure that I was going to say I was going to disable real time. I'm going to disable the real time override. It's not going to let me. So I'm going to go t dot max fps, and I'm going to limit the fps to 30, which is going to put less strain on the GPU. There you go, stat fps. Now you'll be able to see that it never will go. Uh, above 30. And there's definitely something funny going on because it normally wouldn't dip. It would normally be rock solid here, but hey ho. Back into the material editor. We can we, we, we went and we pressed in the, in the details panel here with the output node selected, use material attributes. Okay. So that is what's changed our output node to just having a simple, single input. And what we're going to do instead is we're going to drag out of here and we're going to search make material attributes. And you can see that this looks exactly the same as how this output node used to look. It allows us to set up a material. And if we plugged in textures to this, it would look identical. Okay, so now we're going to hold V on the keyboard, V for vector, and we're going to left click, which is going to create this vector parameter. And I'm going to change the name of this parameter to grass color, using the English spelling, of course. I'm then going to go click down here, and I'm going to put it to a nice lurid shade of green. I'm going to take the output of that and plug it into our base color, which will give us our first layer. And now I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to copy it one time for every layer that we have. I actually, I'm not going to do every layer. I'm just going to copy it twice. Okay. And I'm going to call this one rock, rock color. And we're going to call the last one sediment color. And we're just going to set a different color for each of those. So we've got our three layers set up. How do we control the blending between them? Well, we're going to search in in the material in the material graph. We're going to right click and search blend, and you can see the very first option we get is blend material attributes. So it's a simple matter of plugging. The first material into the A pin and the second material into the B pin. And then we're going to copy the blend material attributes and do it again. Take the output of the last one and we'll plug it into our final material attributes. Okay, so we've got our layers, we've got our blend material attributes. Now we need to define the weight that is going to blend between them, the weight of B layer. So the way that we do that is we create something called a landscape layer sam sample. And I'm going to call this layer grass. Except that actually that's incorrect. The reason that's incorrect, maybe you can guess, is because A is the first input and A is our grass layer. B is in fact the rock layer. So I need to set this layer sample to be rock, which means that we need to determine where the grass layer goes somewhere else. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy this layer sample up here. We're going to call it grass. Now we're just going to copy the blend material attributes, the make material attributes. We're going to pull the output of that and put it into B. And we're going to plug the 
grass layer sample into the alpha blend. Now we're going to create a new empty material attributes and we're just going to put a value of zero into the base color, meaning that it'll be completely black if we assign it to anything. This is the layer that's going to get assigned by default if we don't have any weights, any actual textures plugged into any of our weight maps. I've now reconnected the output of that first blend material attributes into the A pin of the second. And at this point, uh, we are good to go. Um, oh, except for one thing, I just forgot I needed to add the weight map. The uh, I needed to, to rename this sediment so that it creates a landscape layer called sediment, which we can apply the weight map that we exported from Houdini to. Okay, this material is all ready and prepped, and we could use this now to uh, sort of show those textures that we generated in Houdini. Okay, so I'm going to hit Shift 2 to jump back into the, the landscape mode, and then I'm going to hit Shift 1 because I need to go back into the regular mode because I forgot to select the landscape and go down to the landscape material, just apply that in there. There you go. By default, the specular is one, so you can really, really see a juicy rendition of all of those lovely details you get from the real world terrain. So we'll just take a moment to admire that. All right, admiring it finished. So you can see that we've already got those layers now inside of the landscape panel, uh, which we created in the material, and they're showing up the correct color. Uh, we're not in the paint tab, so I'm going to quickly switch over to that. And you can see that underneath the name of the layer, uh, there's currently something, it just reads none. And we need to, before importing our weight maps we expected from Houdini, just set up a weight blended layer for each of these. So there are a couple of options that present themselves as weight blended layer and not weight blended layer. A not weight blended layer allows you to do some interesting things with how the layers blend together. But a weight blended layer is going to mean that as you paint each layer, it erases the other, which is the simplest functionality uh, in terms of usability. And it's the one we're going to go with for now. Um, so you're going to create that weight blended layer. You have to save it somewhere in the project. And that's an asset effectively, which contains some information about the layer, including whether it's weight blended or not weight blended, but also other things like physical uh, material attributes. So uh, that is kind of how does how, how much friction does the surface have and what kind of audio should we play uh, when you step on it, if your project has that kind of functionality. The first weight blended layer will take the longest time to set up and then the others should go quite quickly after that. And once they're all set up, uh, we'll finally be in a place to start importing those uh, textures um, I also forgot that I needed to save the level, uh, so uh, that could have been bad. I could have lost all the progress uh, in the tutorial up to this point, so I'm just going to go ahead and quickly save that. All right, so we've got our three layers, and by default, our terrain is grey. How curious. We will soon put an end to that. So you might be wondering why the landscape has this weird yellow tint to it. And, and that's because I've enabled a feature called SSGI. I'm just going to go ahead and turn that off. There we go. So that's without any SSGI enabled. That's with SSGI turned on and then tweaked in the post-processing. Um, so by default, your landscape will look more like this. And uh, now we just go in and I'm going to import layer by layer, starting with grass. So I'm going to import from file. Come to think of it, the grass should probably be everywhere. So I'm going to right click the grass and I'm going to hit fill layer. There we go. We have our lurid green grass everywhere. And the next one I want to import is the rock. So I'm going to go import from file. And I believe, if I remember correctly, the one I'm looking for is the last one down there. So I'm going to double click that. There you go. And now finally, I'm going to go to the sediment. I'm going to go import from file, and we're going to grab that flow map texture that we generated. And there you go. We could, of course, make this look a lot better if we jump inside of our material. It would be better to make a material instance, but we'll just modify the values in the material for now. So we can go into the, the green here. I'm going to darken that down a bit. I think that's, I'm already a little bit more happy with that, but I'll desaturate it and make it even darker. Now I'm going to go to the rock color, which is potentially all right, actually. Actually, I don't really mind that. So we're going to leave the rock as is. And we're going to find this very, very strange yellow color that I created uh, and try and settle and possibly just another kind of green for that. 
uh, maybe maybe a bit darker. I'm gonna play around with it. Uh, maybe maybe more yellow, maybe more brown. Um, let's go with now. Let's go with a, another green, but slightly more yellow and yeah. I mean that'll do for now. And as I'm sure you can tell, this is far from a finished crafted landscape material. I mean. It doesn't even have any textures, but I hope that it proves the point that you can go from nothing to something that's actually quite representative reasonably quickly. And this is a major part of developing games. You don't set out to create the most amazing thing that you plan in your head from day one. You need to iterate, and sometimes the most important thing is making the first mark on paper or on the screen. It's hard to know what your goals will be once you've reached halfway through a project, and you may find that you've stuck with some decisions that you made when you were iterating on your, land on your landscape right at the start. And doing big steps like this, keeping them simple, allows you to uh, be more flexible and to make those changes when you need to. As I said at the start, this isn't a landscape material tutorial, but that's the one that I plan to do next. And we'll be looking at how you can set up your own landscape material from scratch uh, inside of Unreal. We'll be keeping it basic uh, and just building on the foundational material setup that we created today. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you've got any suggestions for how I can improve these videos, um, since this is only my second one, I would be very grateful to hear your thoughts and feedback in the comment section. Uh, please like and subscribe uh, if you like this kind of content and want to see more of it. Uh, and hopefully uh, some of you uh, I will see next time. Bye.